For those uh, who were born in 1970s, perhaps 1980s, you will remember a tagline from 1980s uh, movie Robocop, which was part man, part machine, all cop, Robocop. <laughs> Do you remember that one? All right. So we had to make a different tagline for our next speaker, part engineer, part anthropologist. So Tanya transitioned from being a power engineer to being a power anthropologist. And as she explained in a recent interview for Anthropologia 2.0, yeah, um, Tanya has been bringing together what one might see as two radically different disciplines. But in fact, she thinks engineering and anthropology provide complementary insights, and she has found it easy to combine them. And Tanya has done research which has shed light on electricity as a social phenomenon, arguing for the importance of the political and social nature of energy. Her fieldwork was taken from Zanzibar, Kenya, Malawi to India and Norway. And we are delighted to have her here in Durham today so she can tell us more about her journey. Tanya Winter, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, have, um, I decided the question, are we delaying or enhancing solutions to the energy dilemma? And by we, I refer to, of course, the globe is delaying, but as we, as anthropologists, are we delaying or are we actually helping solutions? And I will do this by reflecting a bit now on, on what I, how I've worked with energy over the years. Uh, and I must excuse myself in advance for becoming rather self-centered at times, because the organizer wanted me to tell you also about, a little bit about the story of how I entered anthropology and engineering and how this, how this uh, co collaborating or, or merging two disciplines, how it works and how it maybe doesn't work. So I will also tell you some problems, challenges I've met. So the outline is as follows. Um, first, just, you know, recapture what is the energy dilemma about. Uh, and then little, the, this little personal story of how, I, how and why I wanted to become engineer and anthropologist later. Uh, and a little bit on how I practiced this, uh, particularly in interdisciplinary teams. And then round off with how can we contribute to solving energy dilemma. So if this image here can symbolize the energy dilemma, we can focus on the tree, uh, obviously the globe is suffering and solutions are needed. And for this, we need to reduce consumption. That's what we know so well. And if we look at the bulb itself, it's also a reminder that some people don't, many people don't have access to electricity and that electricity is vital. So I have uh, been interviewing people in, in different contexts, um, hundreds of them, who, who have experienced the change from using kerosene or maybe the light from the firewood. Um, for reading, for doing things in the evening, and they have experienced this shift to electricity, and I can assure you it's a magic shift. And if we also think about the mobile phone, it's becoming now maybe the main drive for electricity. So people want to use a mobile phone. I think it's approaching five billion people today have a mobile phone. Uh, and we also see how they use this for banking, and you know, it's part of everyday life in very remote places with no grid at all. Another uh, typical, um, typical item is the, is the computer. So in Ikisaya village where we work, people were referring to computer literacy as something that children really need to learn to be able to cope with, with, uh, with getting jobs and so on. So this is entering everywhere. Um, and also as a reminder to what anthropologists in particular can bring, when we, what, what, we, what do we look for when we search for the... For, for the electricity, the impact of electricity and so on. This is a, uh, from Ikisaya, this was a, one man, it's not the same that you will have a quote from very soon, but we were helping uh, or collaborating with the community to establish an energy center. So there were lanterns and mobile charging. And then because the funding was so limited, uh, we have to have a really, uh, really tough discussion really on what to, what to give priority to. So from the, all the, the group work uh, discussion and so on, we, it came out that we re they really wanted uh, a television set in the village. 
So as in the center, there would be a separate room where people could come and pay five shillings to watch news and football games and so on. And to illustrate what this, what this means to this, the population in question, one man said, when I have seen what the president looks like, I will also feel like being part of Kenya. So this is to do with dignity, belonging, uh, various aspects that can't be measured in, in money, of course. So this is part of the story. Now to anthropology. What we really like is to search for variation, isn't it? We put emphasis on context. Everything is contextualized. Uh, and we, we claim at least to be non-normative. I, I have some people, some colleagues from more uh, cultural studies saying that we, oh, you're not normative. You always want to, to look for the, the research that you know, focuses on the poorest and marginalized groups. You have some kind of uh, overall ambition here. But at least in terms of methodology, we really strive to be non-normative. So we want to have people's own perspective, not be judging, not, not leading questions. We want to spend time learning how they think and, and feel and act. And then, of course, we often arrive, our conclusions, our results are often you know, demonstrating complexity. That is, we are very good at complexity. Uh, and we use rather, well, concepts that we maybe, when we, when we get used to them, they don't feel that way. And we, we feel they really fit, um, fit the realities uh, and they're good to think with, as I do myself. But they can also be, be you know, abstract to, to people outside the discipline. So why do we highlight, you know, remoteness? What, what, is, the, what is remoteness in a way? Or, or belonging? Why is it important? Now, coming from here, what we somehow, I think this is what we often do, um, how do we then meet the, the requirements from policy and practice when we think about solutions for solving energy dilemmas? We have discovered in development that the, you know, the evidence that really matters is the quantified ones. You should have a sample of at least two, you know, 2,000 before you can say, claim that you know realities. Uh, they also want clear conclusions, they want recommendations for policy, you know, you should be very focused on what kind of policy or what kind of technology could bring this particular change. And they want, want general solutions, universal solutions. So how do, they, how do we manage to deliver what they want when we work from this yellow, yellow frame, frame here? So I will not uh, even try to, you know, to, to tell or to suggest how, how we can do it, but I will rather try to illustrate this dilemma by looking at some of my own work. So becoming first engineer and anthropologist, I think I will go back to when I was 17, because that was a major moment when I started to think, what will I do with my life? Uh, and there were three things that I, I recall as really important. And one of them was, uh, I was, I was always interested in electricity, and we learned in Africa there's a problem of electricity. And I couldn't figure out, you know, Africa with all these solar, solar suns always uh, shining. There was a, um, a pop, the pop group Aha at the time, the Norwegian pop group. They had a, do you know the song? There was one song, the sun always shines on TV, yes. But it shines on Africa. And how can electricity be a problem? That was one of the mysteries. Um, the other thing that made an impression on me was in social science class to le learn about um, imperialism, colonialism, and so on. So this was part of my, the story. And then I had a mother who always told me that you should become independent, support yourself. She was a housewife. She wanted, you know, go for it yourself. So I always thought I would provide for my husband and family, actually. <laughs> uh, but I, so this inspired me also to think about, I had the colonna in the, you know, those, uh, give, uh, putting up a table, various types of education I could do. And, and typical for women was one of the, the, the ones I ticked off. But then I had another question at this time, because we were, I, was, I was doing A-level science, so we had mathematics, but then for the, for the last year in, um, in college, we were to select between, um, um, between physics or chemistry as the, for the last year, and I didn't really know what, what to choose. So uh, I went to this advisor school, an old man, and asked for his advice, telling him about my interests and you know, what, what should I choose. And he replied to me quite uh, bluntly, it's a well-known fact that girls and physics <laughs> don't go well together. <laughs> so, of course, I went directly to technical college, <laughs> the technical <laughs> university. Um, so partly provoked maybe, but also because I thought here I could really learn about, you know, solar energy and then take, going to Africa someday. I had this, this plan. But I hadn't done my research very thoroughly because when I came to this power engineering cl class, 
um, where we were 10% women, and that was a, a record year for gender balance. <laughs> so so they, um, I discovered that there was absolutely no solar power on that syllabus. I hadn't checked. I just presumed. So this was, but it was all hydroelectric power that Norway is so good at, and we have done for 100 years. So I learned a lot about you know, planning various uh, rivers and so on for optimi optimizing um, production, but not so much on so about solar. The only thing I remember was um, an assignment in, a, in, a, in class where we were to, to you know, always calculate, so you get an assignment and you calculate. And the, the, um, the subject given was, if you have you know, uh, solar panels one, one meter wide, how long will it have to be to support you know, a tiny Norwegian village? <laughs> And the answer was from uh, Lindesnes to Nordkap, to the very lo uh, from the very south to the very north, so more than 2,000 kilometers. How stupid is solar, you know? So it was really just giving the, the comment that this is not for the future, uh, at least not for Norway. But what was good here was that after four years, and I was mostly in st at student society, I must admit, but here um, I got to choose my master topics. So then I looked, started to look for a project um, and where Norwegians have been involved, and I, I discovered the Zanzibari Rural Electrification Project. So I wanted to go and, and look, look at this from, you know, from the engineering side and also from the local side and so on. I was not trained in anthropology, but this was also the time when I learned that there is a whole discipline called anthrop anthropology when I was doing uh, engineering. So I thought that a good thesis would be to look at the socio-economic um, aspects of electrification. I didn't dare to use the word culture because I'd done nothing on culture yet. Um, uh, so, so I thought this would be a good, good thing. And I wanted to go to Zanzibar to, to, do, to get also empirical data. So when I suggested this to my professor in um, power engineering, he, he asked me, do, we, do you intend to get a job? <laughs> he thought this was very, very strange. But I was allowed to go, and I spent uh, three wonderful months in Zanzibar 91, being the student of engineering. And this was then the, where I went back as an anthropologist um, fellow uh, 10 years later, and the book came later. Um, so Zanzibar, you know, social, following electricity as a social uh, gu a guide through the social landscape, it was fantastic. And when I came later here than with a PhD. So this, these are all, not all my children, but there's one there. Uh, and with my, um, and my husband, we, we somehow, I did a typical classical anthropological fieldwork, ethnography, spending a year in the village. So, but, but what I discovered was particularly among the engineers, I, engineering company, the electricity company was also part of my data. So I wanted to look at the relationship between them and, and the population. And there I could really feel that they wanted to keep my identity as engineer alive, alive you know. They didn't want to forget my background here. Uh, and that was good in a way. So this is a, this is a, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So this is a day load curve. It shows the electricity consumption over. So I was playing with these, you know, looking at differences between Ramadan and ordinary days. And so we had this, we, we could speak about uh, these issues um, and had this joint, um, jo joint interest and also the language. It's probably, you know, most efficient, efficient way to, you know, well, the, the, most, the, the most beneficial part of being an engineer is to be able to talk to other engineers. Um, and also electricity was a kind of politically innocent topic and very desired so I got you know I was I was allowed to come everywhere and they were they were very keen to show me things um, but I also discovered that I, that they maybe the presence and my connections to the Norwegian project also made made them expect that I needed to see some action here so I asked them how many how many consumers do you have in the various villages you know we we want to count what is countable so in, in addition to the more a typical anthropological thing. We want also to know, know a bit the context and so on. So I asked this question several times and you know, people didn't have time to give, give them to me. But then one day uh, the customer manager said that, yes, we, I, I, will, um, I can help you now. Because, uh, you have, because of your request, we will initiate an in investigation of all illegal connections in Zanzibar. So he was planning to take a team and go through every village and then sanction those who, who were doing illegal things. And of course, if there is one thing we are concerned with not doing is to cause harm to people we, we study. So I said, no, 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 the numbers are not that important anyway. <laughs> 
So to me, this was then my first an anthropological experience that year. And, and to me, anthropology felt like coming home. So I have even put another heart here. <laughs> And I've heard about other students coming from other disciplines, biology or, you know, into anthropology and, 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 and some of them experiencing that anthropology is maybe difficult concepts or some, something. But I, I, to me it was more like something always missing until I met anthropology. So it was the other way around. Um, so I'm this kind of hybrid um, and I also in this process in Zanzibar being there um, and trying to come into the, to anthropology, I discovered a, a gap between disciplines. So I, if you have here engineering on one hand, now I must be careful, this is engineering and here's anthropology. So this is what Marit Mel, who wrote um, when I was then taking up anthropology. I've said, in, and this is in a book on, uh, or a chapter on gender development and appropriate technology. And she says, I have said very little about technology and nothing about appropriate technology. This is not a coincidence. I'm not a technical expert. And I was thinking, wow, but you are the anthropologist, you know people, you know technology and context, and you somehow, it was like she was um, mystifying technology and, and, not, and being very, very humble, you know, not, being, not declaring that I can say something about this. On the other hand, the an engineering, uh, engineer I met in, one of them in, in Tanzania, he was not so humble. He said, people studying culture are sitting in their offices in Oslo, thinking they know people. But as engineers, we are the ones who are out in the field and know how things really are. <laughs> so he was quite rather hostile. Um, and and I, I, would, I would never think about engineers pl even, even having the idea of planning a whole conference. Why? why why the world needs engineers, you know. <laughs> it's, somehow, it's somehow taken for granted. And I, that was also my impression entering anthropology. You know, in the undergraduate courses, we had at least four articles discussing why anthropology should be a discipline and why we are so good, you know. So, and, and compared to the engineering part, where there was absolutely, we just went directly to the equations the first day in, in, at university, and there was no, you know, not even philosophy courses. So there's a, and I'm, de I'm very, very um, convinced that engineering would, may, you know, would benefit from becoming a little bit more self-reflexive. -ref and that is maybe just my idea now, but it, uh, some, some, a way that anthropologists and engineering can, you know, uh, inspire each other is to, is to reflect on their own disciplines, you know, how, how we work and what are the shortcomings and what is it, how, how does our own role affect what we actually uh, find. Right, so that was the discipline. And then a little bit on the bureaucracy side of combining subjects. So I, uh, having the idea of going back to Zanzibar now, starting a PhD, I found the Center for Development and Environment, um, a bit a coincidence, but they were just, you know, we are, we are interdisciplinary. You want to study, you're an engineer and you want to be an anthropologist, welcome. And then, and then Norwegian Research Council gave me money with, you know, with very, very weak project uh, <laughs> description. And then I tried to enter the Department of Anthropology. That was not the, the easiest part. So when I went to, to, the, to the department, talked to various um, people, I was told by one professor, okay, you can try. If you succeed, you will show that when an engineer can do this, this anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so I, it didn't stop me. And, and then the, my center helped establish a, a a transition program so I could do the, I had done the undergraduate, but I did the master's uh, theory courses in six months. Um, and then I revised the pros proposal and so it become, I could be accepted to the program. Right, so that's the, the little bureaucracy part. Uh, but it, I, I must also admit, I, did, I didn't feel like a real anthropologist until maybe one month before I was to hand in my thesis after four years, you know, I, I, it really took a, took a long while before I felt like an anthropologist. Um, yes. Okay, so let's go a little bit to the, how I practice. I, I, I will do this very shortly, but, uh, or briefly, but to, to give you also, to arrive at some of the, the challenges or different perspectives we have had as engineers, economists, and anthropolo anthropologists working together. Uh, so my research has uh, focused on two geographical areas and also topics. So one is on sustainable consumption in Norway uh, particularly, and I've been collaborating with Sophie and, 
and also Sandra a little bit on, on comparing Fra with France and, and the UK. So this is from an ecological village in, in Norway. Uh, and the second part is to do with electricity access, electricity being new, very much continuing what I did on Zanzibar. Uh, and this is the energy center from Kenya where we, where we collaborated on setting this up. Uh, and it, uh, this reminds me now of, um, of a little story. I, I read something of, uh, that Maya Green had written about Tanzania and she was puzzled by why is it when we have this participatory development um, framework, you know, we want people to engage in their own development. Why is, that, is it that every project turns up so equally? Um, and she studied the, this, these things and she could see that when they wanted participation, they invited two people from the village discussing in the project, you know, in the office in maybe Dar es Salaam in the town. Um, and there was this project where they wanted to in introduce toilets in the villages, public toilets. So they invited two people to talk and they had discussions and they went home and they made a project and nobody were using the toilets. So she found out that um, they had not been really representing their own interests. This, this development uh, space was not uh, the same as they had before. So, so for me, having read this, I was very concerned that we should build, when we constructed this house, not, not me, but the, the people here have constructed the, this house, we should have a separate toilet with one toilet for men and one toilet for women, because that, was, that had been the problem, I forgot to say, in Tanzania, that men and women could not use the same toilets. That was the part of the explanation why it failed. So when we were to build this one, I was determining, yes, we should have one for men and one for women. So it is there now, but then I asked later, would it matter if, we, if it was the same? Oh yes, we would use it anyway. So again, I, was, <laughs> I had gone into the same trap, not investigating before, you know, actually making a uh, suggestion. Right, so this is, um, these, are, these are the two contexts, and I will very briefly just give you one example from each of them, also to show how I, I, we try to work with other disciplines. Now, um, in development, we see so many studies on the impact of electricity where they look at either you have electricity or not, and what is the impact on, for example, girls and boys' reading time, the reading time. And then the empowerment issue comes in. Does this mean empowerment? And, and maybe to some individuals who I have colleagues in Kenya who say yes, because we got electricity in the village where I grew up, that is the reason why I'm sitting here with a PhD. I mean, this for the individual level. It can be really, really important. But can we, can we generalize here and say, invest in a lamp and let a girl read and it will be empowerment? You see, of course, this is a simplistic um, model. But if you have heard about, you know, in the micro-credit micro discourses, they say, invest in, a, invest in a cow and let a girl, you know, for, for a girl, and then she will prosper and her family will prosper and the village will prosper and the whole, you know, society. So it's a very focus on her, this, you know, the, the agency of every little individual to change the whole world. So it's, these discourses are, are very much alive. So what we here do is to try to look, you know, first of all, ask people also what empowerment actually means to them. Uh, and it's the, also the why, why and why not of electricity, also un, unintended consequences. Uh, and, and these red arrows is also symbolizing the structures that are discriminating and hindering, you know. So electricity alone couldn't change everything, but how does this interplay with other factors? So you can see here that towards complexity, isn't it? I mean, we try to bring in all the factors that matter um, uh, and making the, the story complex. And the, our challenge is then how to make these findings applicable back to policy. It's not easy. In the north, in, this, in Norway, we have looked at various types of um, initiatives or technologies um, intended to promote sustainable consumption. So we have here in-home displays, heat pumps, and information provided on electricity bills. And this was on guarantees of origin where people were asked to, to pay extra to have re uh, electricity with a guarantee. And um, compared to this, you know, the southern, the southern type of... Um, of context, looking at electricity access, people want it. Here, people don't want energy savings, you know, so it's a completely different social, uh, more anti-drive than drive towards change. So the question is, can these devices then help, help you know, solve some of the, the problems? And to just to give the example of the heat pumps, the, this is the course, you know, the, the chain of events that is supposed to happen, that you have this fantastic, efficient technology, heat pumps. 
it, it, it uses only one third of the electricity compared to an ordinary oven in electricity in Norway. So you, you want energy savings, you introduce this, the people exchange it as if nothing else had happened and you get energy savings. It's a kind of presumed chain here. But when we look at what is, what is happening in practice, we see that people, when they buy it, they're not only concerned with energy savings, actually comfort is what most people said. Uh, and then there are all, all kinds of also practical issues, you know, we wanted to renovate, this was a good timing, we want to avoid the, the carrying wood and so on. Uh, and the means is then to integrate into practical, uh, well, social practices in daily life. And energy savings, very few were, were um, convinced that they had actually saved or not. But there are all these kinds of, you know, benefits from that kind of pump, so it's good, it's, it's, it increases comfort def definitely. But from statistical numbers here with the collaborating partners, we also see that the whole effect on the energy saving caused by the, en the heat pump in Norway was offset by a re rebound effect, both because people uh, want to have more comfort and because they go from wood to this one, this is using, using electricity. So the whole, the whole effect is eaten. So our, our point is not only to, so, well, the challenge for us is when we, when we discover this complexity here, how do we then uh, give solutions back to policy? So at least we can say that only efficient technologies alone will not change the picture. Maybe it has to do with, uh, and maybe a consequence is that you should not subsidize these heat pumps because now they are also one third of all Norwegian families have them at home. So they should not be, they should not be uh, subsidized. Otherwise you're actually um, subsidizing the, you know, the, those with detached houses and the people living in blocks where these are not, uh, allowed, they will suffer compared to others. But it could also be then uh, trying to look at how heat pumps together with maybe taxes on electricity or whatever, you know, have, having more strict regulations also. Because that is very much the, the, what we find that information, the soft measures do, do not make the change, but you need to have stronger mechanisms. Now, this was a bit depressive, but it was, intended to show that we, we get, you know, complexity is the answer and how do we feed back? So, so this is what, more the question I ask you. Right, and then on collaborating with ec economists. Here we have, um, yeah, this was Hege Vesco before we became very close and we now don't, don't even know who's written what, so we <laughs> it's been a process. But in the beginning, starting to work with ec economists, we spent one year just figuring out, you know, what kind of framework to use, what concepts to use. Because the main, the main difference between us is that we are thinking of, of social phenomena through relationships. People are embedded in social relations and with technologies and their, their contexts, whereas the, the economists would focus on the individual. So we spent a year trying to, have to figure out how do we then work together. And this was the kind of symbolizing here that we look at the outer, outer square is the, the social practices and the structures working on people, whereas behavior is what a person does here in the middle, turning on and off the, the switch, for example. And we use this also with Sophie in the comparative article on France and Norway, trying to look at electricity cultures and how, how people, because they live in different, they have different uh, you know, habits and practices, they will also respond to policy measures differently. But then to go even closer to what we, you know, how we work and the methods here. Uh, the economist and I, we, would, we were listening to the same person in an in a interview at, at home uh, with her and we listened to the same conversation and we heard a little bit, emphasized a little bit different things from that conversation. So the economist would say that this person has a strong environmental concern, an attitude, uh, interpreted as an attitude, and she rarely eats meat. It was her, her notes. We compared notes. It was very interesting. Whereas the anthropologist would say, would say, yes, in this interview, she expressed a strong concern for the environment and she seemed uninterested when receiving the chocolate. We gave them a, <laughs> we gave them a little, uh, you know, to compensate for their time. So if you think about, you know, the differences between these two, these two, two interpretations, what is the difference? Yeah, so to, to me, she is, she is very much uh, here, there's kind of based on one, one statement, she, uh, there's kind of essentialization, she's 
she, she says she has some, something enduring. She will always have this attitude in a way wherever she goes. Whereas the anthropologist would interpret this one statement in the context and be very careful to say that, to, to think that this will be the, what she's meaning when she talks with her husband on, you know, maybe same issue even. So we, because we are so focused on the context. And of course the chocolate is something, we, we bring in everything and maybe it's, to another person it seems totally irrelevant, you know, whether she would receive that chocolate. But to us, I mean, everything that happens uh, might at, at least potentially have a significance. Uh, now, in contrast, working with engineers has been much easier in a way because we don't have to fight, you know, have about how the world is. We just know that, yeah, you are good at this and I'm good at this. And preferably you should have uh, some women here. But, um, but the, the problem here is that you get to write the article all by yourself because they don't contribute. <laughs> but they contribute in the, in the collecting the data. Now, to how we can contribute, the last, last part. I was just attending a workshop with, with colleagues from various disciplines, and I told them about this conference, and, you know, and, and I asked them, do you perceive me being more engineer or more anthropologist? And they were clear, okay, you are, you're anthropologist. And I asked them, why, so why do you think, what, how would you explain, why, why do you say that? And then one of them said, because I open up, that's, that's your mission in a way, to open up. Uh, and the other one said, it's the perspectives you use. And I said, isn't it because I focus on people rather than technology or something? No, 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 we all do that. But you, there's a way you, way you look at it and the way you open up the, the question and, and, and the perspectives you use to, to, to look at it, to understand it. And I think that is, that is kind of maybe very describing for anthropology in, in, in interdisciplinary teams. And I think there are some, you know, in, in policy, there are some very simplistic models of change as I've been touching on. So we are really needed to, to, to balance those and to make ourselves um, you know, re relevant uh, to what kind of models are being used. Uh, and of course the, the need to focus on relations and the situations of various groups that people are not, this, it's not a homogeneous group we are talking about when it comes to um, solving the energy dilemma. It's very, very fragmented and, and we need to, uh, to look at the differences. Right, and then to... I will uh, end, my, end by this. Five recommendations um, that we should trust that we embody, embody a particular set of theories and, and perspectives. Um, and, and that these are also very, actually very suited for understanding the real world and therefore also uh, making it better. I mean, you can have all kinds of fancy models. If, if they're not realistic and attuned towards realities, they will not have the intended effect and they can also produce negative effects. Uh, and then, as I've indicated, you know, what I struggle with is to provide clear recommendations. I mean, this is, as Sophie mentioned, I think the, the issue of language and we need to translate to other, others outside our, our own um, circles. And then continue to do what we do but search maybe for new area, areas of research. Um, and not least also strengthen our influence on the research agenda. It was common, at least in development, that when a project had failed, anthropologists were called in to explain why it failed, you know, always, always behind. <laughs> then, so I think in, in the, uh, well, that is what the, the focus now on interdisciplinarity is is providing is a potential for anthropologists to also, uh, you know, raise the most important questions and be in the front of, of, of thinking about new projects to initiate together with other disciplines. And then and a last recommendation is to, to bring uh, colleagues to the field, you know, interdisciplinary field work. Because it's very, very uh, useful when you start to, to discuss the interpretations and so on. And it's also very much fun. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Tanya, for this fascinating speech. Um, I'm sure there are some answers for our guest, part engineer, part anthropologist, quite an extraordinary being. <laughs> Have we got anyone like that in the room, by the way? Quite a yeah, few, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So any questions for Tanya? 
Yes? <laughs> Hello, thank you. I thought that was really interesting. I'm actually an IT consultant who uh, moved into anthropology, so um, I, uh, I really connect with what it was that you were saying. I think for me, the, um, the biggest challenge is around making recommendations. Mm. Um, when I came into anthropology, I spent quite a lot of time coming up with ideas for solutions and kept being held back from that um, and came to appreciate that anthropology isn't actually about providing the solutions and providing the recommendations. So I think your observation to provide the recommendations is, is significantly challenging um, for the discipline and I just wondered how you've gone about tackling that. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I think um, I think to me the, the most uh, when I think what where I feel I have had most impact on what policy is doing, it has been in uh, situations where I first somehow have a I have a research topic that's that somehow is an, in matches their own uh, interests. For example, the issue of gender equality in electrification programs. So because I've done this ethnography and I wrote a kind of you know easy easily accessible piece on that. The, the World Bank discovered this work and they, they invited me in to also, you know, to, to provide background papers for the World, the World Development Report. And now we're in a project with DFID where I meet once a year with, you know, people engaged in, in uh, electrification and, and focusing on gender. So, so it's more than long, it's somehow first just showing a kind of work that, that they find interesting and then the more long term collaboration where maybe the, the way of thinking just by looking at you know what kind of um, topics do we actually want to have highlighted in the next report it can be very but maybe that is a very pragmatic because it is very hard to say yes we should we should include at least 50 percent women in all kind of projects we I mean we could say it but it's it's more a claim than than so so I think always rooted in the in the empirical knowledge that's where we where our strength is and then bringing some of these and being good at picking what we want to show them as teasers for them, their interest in us and then trying to work together. Yeah. It's very interesting talk, thank you very much. Uh, like yourself, I'm also an engineer and anthropologist and always very excited to find other people. Um, <laughs> One of the things you talked about was in engineering education mm -hmm. and about how you think that in anthropology, uh, when you started learning about it, a lot of it was reflection of why we need anthropology, but in engineering, you just jump straight into the equations. How do you think, uh, or do you think that any type of changes need to be made to the education um, for engineering, and what type of changes do you think need to be made, and at what level? Do they need to be made right at the beginning, like as an undergraduate, or is it something for more of a post-undergrad? Hmm. Thank you. Yes, it's a very important question. Um, and as I somehow indicated, I did not find the engineering program at all fulfilling. It was, uh, I mean, all kinds of, but very monological, you know, and only equations. But but that is also 30 years ago, so that it might have changed. I know that my department in, at the University of Trondheim, they changed the label from power engineering to environment and, and uh, energy and environment. And that year they changed the title, the rate of women applying increased, but then they discovered it's just the same as before, so it went down. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously I think young students, you know, the first, maybe you're already in the bachelor level, they need to open up and see the, see the purpose of what they actually are doing. I think it could be doing, you know, the first semester, just to have a kind of energy society, positioning energy and, and showing some of the dilemmas. And I think that is, you know, also key for having more women recruited in, in power engineering to see also the more societal relevance because women are often also interested in that kind of link also to environment. So having that, but then of course in the, at the, at the, you also need to learn one discipline in thoroughly. So I don't know how, how uh, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't spread too much, but at least opening up in the beginning and then maybe towards after a bachelor, if, they are, if there was flexibility, whether you want to go deeper into to system engineering or if you want to go more to the anthropological or, or, and system is also really um, benefit from, uh, from uh, social science. 
So, but I, but I'm not, you know, I don't have a clear answer. But at least I think it should be uh, at least to, to keep the interest and and motivation. That is what you do in early in the phase. It's not only learning the equations. It's also motivate and making people start to make plans. Yes, I really want to go there. So how can I get there? Yeah. Thank you very much, Tanya, for this really inspiring speech. One more round of applause for Tanya.